This is Angela with Danceable Thoughts, and I'm going to take you through the actual way I would go through this lesson with my students, having them draw this ballerina skeleton. And I want you to see that over here is the list of phrases that I would use, and their abbreviations. This list in the Teachers Pay Teachers packet is purposely scrambled, so they'll have to read through it and follow it. You as a teacher will have the list in order, and you have a separate document that you could also produce for the students, which explains what the reasoning behind each of the little points are. So there's about 24 points I'm going to go through. I want you to see that I start with this skeleton, and purposely, the skeleton doesn't have arms. We'll talk about that on purpose. When you're drawing it, pretty long torso, nice long legs. So this is where we would go, and these are the processes I would take them through. So the very first thing is I'd say, like, ballerinas always think about their feet. Ballet dancers think about their big toe, and their little toe, and their heel. And then I draw it as this crazy duck foot. This is the abbreviation, BT, LT, H. And then for their learning, I would put the equal sign there, because this means that the weight is equally distributed between the big toe, the little toe, and the heel. And then in the explanation, you'd say, even when we go up on releve, we keep that balance between big toe and little toe, and we think about the heel going straight up and under. So that's a way to teach that. Now the next thing that most ballet dancers are thought to you know, concentrate on is their turnout. So we're going to draw a really strange looking pelvis. It almost looks like a, a kind of like a weird diaper. And for the pelvis, you're going to see the word uh, level. Because we want the pelvis to be level. And then I'd also take time to talk about the ball and socket joint. So I put the head of the femur in there. Now we talk also, you know, when dancers are, especially beginner dancers, they think about what their knees look like when they are trying to dance. And one of the mistakes they often make is that they pull these knees in. So we're going to always put this phrase, lifted, not locked, for their knees. Lifted and not locked. So we tell them, okay, that the turnout begins here. Turnout starts in the hip sockets. You can't tell them enough. They're going to try to crank from the, the bottom up, and we want to say no, no, no. And that, that is not achieved by the bones just magically turning out, but that the muscles have to work. And we talk muscles, and I like this image that the muscles wrap around, and that's how we achieve this. And there's a couple of different things that we talk about when the muscles wrap around. So you know as the educator that the muscles are going to have to work together. We teach that to our students. So the first thing we say is that they wrap. So we think about muscles actually starting from way back here in the glutes and then wrapping around and connecting in behind the knees, giving that spiral action. And the other thing that we talk to them about is that the muscles are going to um, if you're really working for equal turnout, you're going to flatten out through the thighs. Now, this is hard for people to achieve that don't have a lot of turnout, but then we're going to talk a little bit about the ballet history related to why we turn out. We're also going to talk about the uh, handsome calves. And I put the word handsome because if you know your ballet history, the reason most of us do things turned out in ballet because the gentlemen were showing off their handsome muscles. So they've got to show off these muscles in their calves. If you want to use the correct gastronemus, all those correct terms, you can do that. But I'm going to do the super simple version. This was the way I taught beginners in a funny way that helped them. So we've got this really strange set of muscles drawn here. But these muscles all work in concert to create turnout takes a lot of effort to create that turnout. It doesn't just happen from cranking around in the hips, but of course it's what we want to focus with them about. So back to the lower half of the body. You've got big toe, little toe, heel. They're equal. You want the knees to be lifted but not locked. We want to think of the muscles working together, the quadriceps and the hamstrings uh, from all the way, and the glutes wrapping, wrapping, and get this curvy feeling, wrapping out and getting in the connect behind the knees. And then we talk about the calves and how they should be beautifully well-developed, flattening through here because the gentleman would be in pants and showing that out. So this is how we do 
the lower third of the body. The next thing that I would talk about is the spine. And this is how I would literally draw the spine. I would do like little, almost like kind of messy triangle X's all the way down. And then we talk about the spine and when we're going to do this, we talk about this being the vertebrae and it's stacked and movable. Stacked and movable. Because we want them to realize that the spine is obviously where all the strength is going to come from. But it's also got the ability to, to move. That it doesn't get locked into a single position. So I make a big deal about that. If you want to be super detailed, you can talk about the three sections of the spine. It's probably a little more than what beginners actually need. Alright, so then the next thing we're going to talk about, and watch how I draw this because the kids always crack up. We're going to draw the ribs. And to draw them, I literally make them like kind of crazy sideways letter C's. So starting to look a little spooky, Halloween-ish. All right. So we talk about the ribs, and we say that the ribs float. That they float. Because you don't want those ribs distended out. You want them to float. You want them to be in line. And then we're going to connect this part of the body to there with our abdominals. And when I draw the abdominals, I literally draw them like a corset. The core equals the corset. And this is where we remind ourselves of our ballet history and we talk about the royal court and that the women would have worn these corsets. And now in our knowledge, the way we teach dancers, we tell the core is what holds us together. We use it for balance. We use it for everything. We do it muscularly. Um, they relied on literally a, a garment they would do. I also give them an idea of the muscles in the abdominals are going to be working up and in and breathe. So it's up, in, and breathe. So I would say they were like a sheet of muscles that pull up and in, and then you still need to make sure that they breathe. That's the part they kind of forget about. The last little piece of detail about all of these muscles is that I literally will put a little spiral in them. Uh, that spiral is supposed to represent that it's twistable. That's my simplified word for the fact that spirals, mobility, that type of thing. So this is starting to look a little crazy. This is why it's so important to teach them section at a time and let them draw it. Um, in the best case scenario, I might even draw each section with a different color. I'm just doing it like this for our video. So this is our middle portion of our body. So we've worked on the lower part, got the middle portion, and now we're going to start working with the upper body. So before I talk about the arms, I'm going to build myself another triangle, which you think of as the clavicle, okay? Um, and I want you to think about the scapula in the back, and I actually kind of pull the muscle. I'm going to draw it in a little bit, and I'm going to say this is the angel wings. Not the angle wings, the angel wings. This is where the connection of the angel wings happens. Because we want to teach our dancers not to, even though it is a ball and socket joint, we don't want their arms to only work from the, the opening in their shoulder. We want them to work from their back. And so now I'm going to draw those big curved arms. I know she's really getting creepy. So this is a big curved arm. So it's connected through those positions in the shoulder blades. And when we talk about the shoulders, we say low, open, and back. And that is uh, also a reference to the ballet history, thinking about the clothing that they wore, how they would keep their shoulders, the posture you would assume as a member of the royal court. If you were a lady, you might have quite a bit of, shall we say, the skin up here on display. You would keep your shoulders low, open and back to make your uh, presence very elegant. The other thing that we talk about when we do that is right in the sternum. I'm going to put a little dot right there, and I'm going to draw it right here. Diamond pendant. 
And this is great for teaching your students projection. So imagine, so you're in the royal court, you're in the royal court dress, you have this beautiful gown on, or if you're a gentleman, you have on an incredibly beautiful encrusted jacket, and you are wearing some sort of necklace that hits you right there in the sternum, and you want to keep your shoulders open, you want to keep this open so that you are showing off the riches and showing yourself off. And this is really helpful for projection all through. So now we've gotten this upper body working a little bit. So I haven't talked about the arms yet, but I am going to talk a little bit about how all of that connects into your neck. So strange way to teach it. But I'm going to draw in the ears. And I, at this point, with my students, would actually tell them to try to stretch behind the ears. I'm going to put stretch. And uh, that's connected to the ears. And I want it to go from your ears down and into your body. Stretch behind the ears. Now you probably tried that just now as I was saying it. And notice how it makes you a little bit longer and taller in your posture. Um, the other thing that happens when we get this drawing is that we're going to emphasize that there is, and I'm going to do a dotted line all around it, that there is shoulder and hip bone alignment. So this is the shoulder and the pelvis, okay, uh, pelvis and shoulder alignment. It's the rectangle, the rectangle. I know that's hard to read, but that's the rectangle of the body that you work on that alignment right there, keeping that all balanced. So when you're having trouble, if you feel like you're falling off balance, you try to maintain that. When you're trying to learn a complicated shape, you can look at the teacher or the choreographer and say, where are the shoulders aligned? Where are the hips aligned? You really think a lot about this when you're doing plie, keeping the shoulders over the hips. So this rectangle that I just dotted in, that's the shoulder hip alignment. So this long, beautiful neck, this also has to do with the way you present yourself all the time. We're going to talk about uh, this openness that you have through your long, beautiful, curved arms. And uh, when we talk about the curved arms, we have to actually talk about, I call them the creases. So I'm going to draw a little zigzag here and a zigzag there that represent the elbows, and I'm going to call those the creases. And you want to open up the creases in your armpit and you want to open up the creases in your elbows. So you think about that, that helps you create the curve. Now we as you know, dance teachers, we know we have to activate all of these muscles, but these images will kind of help them. The other thing we talk about is the hands, okay? And the hands should be very natural. I say NP, no pointers, no claws. Um, one of the things they have a lot of trouble with is that the thumb should relax in there gently and not be tight. I used to say no pointers, no claws, no hamburgers. Some people like that, but no hand, holding the invisible hamburger. It's a relaxed hand. It's a nice generic hand. So after you've stretched behind the ears, you've gotten the arms long and extended, they're connected through the back, all the way out to these fingertips, we uh, use the idea of the raindrop. So it looks a little like an earring, but that's supposed to be a water drop or a raindrop. And it's supposed to fall off of her shoulder or his shoulder and be able to gently curve without getting caught in those creases all the way out to the fingertips. So add the raindrop right there. That's that water drop or raindrop that goes from there to there. So here's your water drop again. So that's a, a, a way to keep the curve in your arms. Now, the last thing I want to talk about in the actual skeleton has to do with up here in the neck, and this is our swivel point. Okay, so I'm going to draw the note right here. I'm just going to put swivel. And we talked to the dancers about the crazy things that happened during the Renaissance court and uh, the royal courts. We talked about the fact that they don't wash their hair very much and that they, the fashion is to wear wigs. And we really, really, really don't want the wigs to fall off because what's underneath it is Wah! So while they have all this beautiful, you know, hair up here, and maybe you think about a tiara or a crown, you, the swivel point would be at your neck 
and, and keeping your shoulders level and you move the head gently. But now as advanced dancers, we do turns and things, we also want to think about that swivel point that our neck has to be mobile uh, for us to do things like spotting when we're turning and we use uh, the idea of a mobile neck, not just stabilized to keep the wig on, but also it's got to move with control. So you cannot skip the neck. The neck has to be loose. Finally, let's talk about our dancer's expression. I'm going to start with a smile because the dancer is supposed to have a pleasant expression. I'm running out of room here. A pleasant expression and that's no matter how difficult it gets, you're supposed to look like it's easy. And I'm going to put some little extra emphasis on the eyes because we want this to be expressive. So yeah, this is kind of a crazy thing to look at. There's a lot to take in. That's why I didn't just reproduce this for you and hand it to you. I wanted you to watch me go through the process. I will produce this in stages for you in my own little handwriting kind of version of this, but this is the way I taught it to my classes and I wanted you to see this. So this is our Ballet to the Bone. I used to call this Betty Ballerina, but we're just going to call her Ballet to the Bone now because we're talking about the muscles and the bones and how they all contribute to creating ballet posture.